we evolve to grow feeble and inefficient with age. We senesce um, as the unavoidable downside of a cancer protection element of our uh, of our physiology and and, and uh, cellular makeup. And the reason that this is relevant here is that. There's a long story which you can go back to Eric's portal podcast with me if you want to know the the gory details of the academic history behind this paper. But I had a collaborator. When I started to do the work on um, telomeres, I ran into a fact that made no sense given what I was coming to understand. And if the fact was wrong, then a lot of things fell into place. And if the fact was right, I was my, my hypothesis was dead in the water. And so I stared a lot at this fact and tried to understand what might be wrong with it. The fact was that mice were all understood to have long telomeres. And the argument that I make ultimately published in this paper that you just saw is that those long telomeres ought to imbue those mice with the capacity for great longevity and mice are very short-lived. And so the fact of mice having long telomeres was a an outlier that could not be explained away unless something very strange had happened. And what I realized over time was that there was reason to believe that the colonies in which we breed laboratory mice had exerted a selective effect that had massively elongated their telomeres and that what the field had concluded that mice or maybe even rodents all have long telomeres was just simply wrong and that the reason that nobody figured that out was that they were all getting their mice from the same source and because they got them from the same source every time people looked at uh, mouse telomeres they found the same thing which is mouse telomeres are ultra long. So laboratory mice having been bred under very particular uh, selective breeding protocols have long telomeres which is quite different from mice have long telomeres or even worse rodents have long telomeres. Right. And, and what it takes is an evolutionary perspective. And in this case, what it took was an evolutionary theorist. But it, you know, it takes evolutionary thinking to say, oh, actually, if we move an organism from its environment into a lab and make a whole lot more of them over a lot of generations, we may have effects that we weren't counting on. And of course, we've seen that in the last two years as well with regard to this, this virus um, that is that is clearly um, not a uh, zoonotic origin, at least only. Right. Yeah. Now, I will say, um, I wrote a piece uh, when Carol Greider, the person that I uh, briefly, not so briefly, collaborated with, I'll tell the story of that in a second, um, but when she uh, and her advisor got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the enzyme telomerase, which is the enzyme, it's a very interesting enzyme, but an enzyme that elongates telomeres. I wrote a piece that never got published um, about the mouse telomere problem. Um, the title of that piece was Of Mice and Markets. And anyway, I'm thinking of putting it up on, uh, on a substack or something. But nonetheless, here's, the, here's the, the upshot. When I realized that uh, I, I believed that mouse telomeres were probably not ultra long and that that was laboratory mice telomeres that were ultra long and that were misleading the field. That was a hypothesis that had uh, earth shattering ramifications if true. A probably false hypothesis that if true was going to have very serious implications for drug safety testing, for lots of laboratory science that we do on topics that are important like cancer and wound healing and, and uh, senescence. And in any case, I contacted Carol Greider, which was somebody I admired from the literature. This was somebody I didn't know, but she was clearly top of the field. Um, and uh, I reached out to her. I called her on the phone and I, uh, she was very gracious. She talked to me. She didn't have to. I wasn't any, I was a graduate student at a different university and yet she, she talked to me. And when I told her what my hypothesis was and why I thought it was true, she said, I don't think it's true, but that's really interesting. And then she gave me uh, some evidence that I had no inkling of, which was that um, not only was the pattern in evidence in Mus musculus, which was the traditional laboratory mouse, but that there was a lesser used mouse called Mus spritus that also showed the pattern. It showed the pattern differently. And the conspicuous thing that she told me was how long the telomeres are in Mus spritus varies based on who you order them from. <laughs> Right, which was strongly suggested that there was something about the laboratory environment. And so the laboratory environment 
I believe has this effect, and we now have a powerful demonstration that it does, based on the fact that those who run breeding colonies, almost no matter how you set them up, will attempt to increase the number of mice they produce per unit of effort, per unit of uh, time, per unit of mouse chow, whatever it is, and that the things that they will do to increase the number of mice uh, will inevitably select for younger animals, and it will therefore unbalance a trade-off between uh, tumor prevention and tissue repair, elongating the telomeres. But here's the reason that shows up here with the things being mislabeled. Carol and her graduate student, Mike Heeman, tested the hypothesis. I didn't, Your hypothesis. My hypothesis. They tested it, and they found that it was correct. They tested a number of different strains of, uh, basically, they weren't wild mice. They, they were mice that had been in captivity for a very short period of time, and they found that they all had short telomeres, right? So, Eureka, this is really important. I now knew that all of the other stuff that was dependent on this particular fact not being what... Uh, everybody seemed to think it was, was meant that all the rest of what I was working on was super viable. And so I wanted to publish it. And I said, Carol, um, where are you going to publish your laboratory result, which I should have been a co-author on? Certainly, I should have at least been acknowledged for providing the hypothesis. But nonetheless, I said, Carol, where are you going to publish this? And, you know, at this point, this is still somebody who's being collaborative and, and uh, very decent to me. And she said something that I was too young and naive to understand at the time. What she said is, we're not going to publish it. We're going to keep it in-house. And I did not understand why. She had this very important result. It seemed to me as somebody who understood science to be an endeavor in which we try to bring important things into the world, that somebody who had just done a laboratory test that had revealed that the mice we're using for all of these other things are broken in some new way that people did not know, that she would be very eager to bring that into the world. And yet she said, no, we're going to keep it in-house. So just, just to clarify for people who aren't on the inside of academic science and, um, and you know, breeding protocols, you know, that later thing being a very small subset of people, um, <clears throat> this result that the Greider Lab generated um, pursuing a test of your hypothesis as a test of your hypothesis revealed that actually the widespread understanding on which uh, was the basis for much of the research that was being done on things like um, telomeres and cancer and senescence at that point, the widespread understanding, which was mice have long telomeres, was demonstrated to be false. They falsified the widespread understanding, which I don't even know if it was ever called a hypothesis, um, by testing your hypothesis that actually um, that's going to be um, that's going to be variable by how long they've been in a lab environment. So what? Who cares? This seems really arcane. Um, the so what? Who cares? Part is actually, um, as it turns out, and as the Greider Lab was beginning to understand, and as you certainly were beginning to understand, um, this will have um, remarkably broad effects on things uh, like drug safety testing. And so if you find this out and you know that your entire field is actually engaged uh, in doing research based on a flawed assumption, and that flawed assumption is going to make the results that are being generated in that field flawed, and that is going to have effects therefore on drug safety results, and therefore on what drugs get to market, and therefore on what people end up being exposed to, and therefore on people's living or dying, it is obviously incumbent upon you to share that with the world. And so it is in that environment that you say to her, where are you going to publish this? And she says, we're not going to, we're going to keep it in-house. Keep it in-house, which I didn't understand, but nonetheless, you know, it, it was what it was. And so I went about writing the paper that I wanted to publish and I uh, was going to cite her work, which is obviously vital to my paper, mm -hmm. which is a theoretical paper. Uh, I was going to cite her as personal communication. Now, ultimately, uh, I did discover that she decided to publish that work. And I won't go too deeply into it, but the question is, why would she have wanted to keep something so important in-house? And the answer, I believe, I don't know because at the point that uh, I went to publish my work, Carol Greider became very strange and pretended that our interactions had been meaningless uh, and 
broke contact. Um, but nonetheless, here's what I now believe I understand. If you know that laboratory mice are defective in a particular way that has uh, a predictable impact on their ability to uh, endure damage, their, their resistance to tumors, all sorts of things. That is potentially a goose that will continue to lay golden eggs, right? Because what it means is that you can predict the results of experiments that others who are not in on this will not be able to predict, right? And so I don't know whether... So that will serve the research coming out of that particular lab, but will uh, negatively serve other research and other science, including drug safety testing, including medicine, including the entire population of the earth who might be downstream of the effects of what drugs do and do not get approved. Yeah, I would say there are two devastating impacts, if that was the logic. Mm -hmm. One devastating impact is that we test our pharmaceuticals on these animals and that the particular defect in question isn't arbitrary. Okay. That a mouse with long telomeres has effectively an infinite capacity to replace damaged tissue and has effectively no resistance to tumors. And in fact, one of the things that Carol told me on that, uh, in our initial, I don't know if it was the first call, but our the several calls that we had was that essentially all laboratory mice die of cancer, right? It's the way they all die. And that's unusual. That's not true for other creatures. And it is I believe clearly the result of this long telomere phenomenon, that the balance between tumor suppression and tissue repair has been completely tilted in the direction of tissue repair, which makes them incredibly cancer prone. But what that also means is that when you give a drug that is toxic to these animals to see how toxic it is, it will have a paradoxical effect. If it's so toxic that it kills the animal outright, you'll see it. But if it's not so toxic that it kills the animal outright, it will, the animal has a preternatural capacity to replace those tissues. And so the animal will be uh, much less damaged than a human would be who has an intense limit on how much tissue repair they can do. And what's more, because, so here's why chemotherapy works. Chemotherapy works because cells that are dividing are more vulnerable than cells that aren't. And in a cancer, the cells are all dividing, so they have this vulnerability. So if you give a person with a cancer a toxic substance, you will poison the person. And you know what they say uh, in, in oncology circles is the idea of chemotherapy is to poison the cancer faster than you poison the patient. Kill the cancer faster than you kill the patient. If you give it to a mouse who has tumors because their tumor suppressor has been turned off, and it functions as chemotherapy, it may actually extend their lives, making it seem like this drug is not only not toxic, but it's actually a bit healthy, right? Which is surprising. So in any case, the long telomeres create an obvious hazard in our drug safety system. I assumed that what would happen at the point that this was revealed is that there would be a, yes, embarrassing, but a rapid campaign to retest all sorts of drugs in light of things like the Vioxx scandal, in which exactly what you would predict if a toxic drug got through drug safety testing uh, unfolded, and it's not the only drug, uh, Vioxx, Fenfen, Seldane, Erythromycin, I mean, the list of drugs that do damage that we did not spot is very long. All the drugs that were tested on these animals need to be retested. I thought that that was going to happen. But the second reason that this is so devastating is that because mice are what we call model organisms, we build our scientific understanding on what we see in mice. Now, everybody knows that they're not perfect models. In fact, there are no perfect models, but they are needlessly broken in this way. They do not have to have long telomeres. And even the, the reason that we breed these animals the way we do uh, is to get a uniform genetic background, which reduces the noise, which allows us to see the effect of treatments and things uh, much more easily in these refined laboratory animals. You can still have that, right? You don't need to get long telomeres. It's not a consequence of, uh, of inbreeding them, we now know. But in any case, the point is damage was done not only to our drug safety system, but also to 
our scientific understanding of how we function. Because this is our primary mammal model, we stacked a lot of bad info on top of itself. And we, you know, that destroys science downstream of it for decades to come until you finally fix it. And then you got to go back and say, well, how many of the things we believe are true are actually false because they came primarily from mice that had been distor distorted in this way. 